and welcome to the Weekly Rushes, your rushed rush through all your movie and streaming news that I've decided to distill down, uh, make digestible, and then regurgitate for you. Doesn't sound particularly appetising, put like that, but there we go. Uh, an awful lot of dramatic sort of off-screen um, um, stories this week. So without further ado, what you can hear in the background is they are watching, uh, Kiki and Nadia are watching Before Sunrise. That wonderful romantic film. Ethan Hawke and, is it Julie Delphi? Julie Delphi? I think so. First story of the week has to be about, and has revolved around, Jonathan Majors. If you don't know who Jonathan Majors is, you probably do now. We first came across him in um, Last Black Man in San Francisco. He won an Emmy, I believe, for his, his part in his role in Lovecraft uh, Country for HBO. Um, he's subsequently been um, in Creed 3 with the boxing film, a sort of spin-off from the Rocky franchise. He's also been in, obviously, he's a pivotal part, and this is perhaps the most, you know, potentially disruptive thing for Hollywood, is he now plays the new... Uh, sort of villain, arch-villain, uber-villain, Thanos-like villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the form of Kang. Uh, and he was recently in Ant-Man, which was panned, didn't do very well, one of the worst performing kind of Marvel films, wasn't very good, but he was the best thing in it. Um, and of course, Marvel have built an entire sort of phase, if you like, of films around him being the arch-villain. This crisis that's developed around this actor um, pivots around the fact that he has been accused uh, of domestically assaulting his girlfriend. He was in a car, there was a, an emergency call rung in, um, there's a lack of clarity as to who actually sort of put the call in, some are suggesting he did, uh, some are suggesting that even though he did, it doesn't mean he didn't do what he did, um, and the accusation was, well, he was arrested for assaulting, strangling and slapping and hitting um, his girlfriend or partner in the car. Jonathan Majors is a lawyer or agent, went into a sort of, you know, he sort of heavy, fast rearguard action of sort of pumping out the texts between Jonathan Major and his girlfriend, which I think they thought kind of made it look like he was less culpable than he was. But if you read into them, read incredibly like an, a, a, a female victim of some form of domestic abuse trying to cover for the person who's hit her. So at this point, it's accusatory. It's their charges. He hasn't been prosecuted. I think he is going to appear in court on May the 8th. But what's developed over this week is that his, uh, I mean, you know, these, these sort of A-list level stars have many, many different agents. They'll, they'll have two or three different agents. They'll have publicists, they'll have managers, they'll all look after different aspects of what their sort of profile is about. Some of them will look after just the acting, some will potentially look just up, look after just the television, Other, others will look after just appearances, and others will look after sort of commercial, you know, advertising kind of gigs and things like that. Um, so uh, he's been dropped by uh, his management team, Management 360, and the lead company. It seems to be a story that seems to be catching fire and spreading quite quickly because what's made this what sort of fanned the flames of this and made this reach beyond simply though it's not just simply for the victim uh, a one-off domestic violence incident stories have been swirling around uh, for the rest of the week from other sort of quarters within the entertainment industry other women are cooperating with the new york district attorney and other women are coming forward claiming and suggesting that they too have been potentially on the receiving end of not entirely dissimilar treatment or behaviour from the actor Jonathan Majors. There was an interesting comment made by a friend of Rachel Weiss, who was in a Broadway show who had obviously worked with Jonathan Majors, and I forget the name of them, but they tweeted something along the lines of, it's not for me to say, but I hope that everyone who's been impacted by this guy starts to speak out. So I think with the chatter being that strong, that's possibly led to some of his agencies and management teams letting him go. He's been dropped from lots and lots of other projects. He was circling an Otis Redding biopic. Um, that looks like it's gone away. This is a real headache for Disney because, of course, he's, he's also the star of a film called Magazine Dreams, uh, which is the story of a troubled bodybuilder. Uh, you know, sometimes you worry that these kind of method actors, if they carry the trauma of their characters into real life, you know, this will start to muddy the waters when it comes to their sort of n normal relationships with people. It's not an excuse, by the way, I'm just saying it. If you've already got a mental health problem and you've, you're, you've got anger management problems and then you take on these roles that are all about anger management or the lack of it or the difficulty of dealing with it, it's not going to help, is it? It's, it's, like, it's like dancing with the devil. Um, but this new film, Magazine Dreams, I think Disney have picked it up. It's a sort of lower 
budget film. He's the producer of that film too. And it's about a sort of troubled bodybuilder, think taxi driver, but in the world of bodybuilding. And there was talk about that very much being nudged towards the sort of Oscar season for 2024. So he's in the ascendancy insofar as he's in big sort of mainstream popular franchise city, you know, attached to films that could in themselves generate over $2 billion worth of revenue. He was on a 20 or is at the moment on a $20 million deal with Marvel for his current commitments. He's in the next season of Loki. Uh, there's obviously the other films, Secret, uh, is it Secret Avengers, uh, Secret Wars, Avengers Secret Wars coming, Kang Dynasty, all that kind of stuff. So he's endemic to an enormous part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, of course, everyone's looking to Marvel and Disney and saying, well, what's their next move? What are they gonna do? And they haven't done anything yet, which could mean one of two things. It could mean they think he's gonna be found innocent. They think that this is something that won't be proven and they can stick to their guns because actually it's gonna be incredibly costly and incredibly difficult to unpick the incredibly complex tapestry that Kevin Feige at Marvel Studios and Disney has, has created uh, or mapped out for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the other reason, really, that a lot of people are suggesting, certain Hollywood insiders, as they say, is that Disney haven't moved yet in this kind of tricky game of chess, because if they move now, there's a chance that still, I think, even at this stage, there's a chance that Jonathan Majors and his team could sue, because their argument would be, there's absolutely no reason to let me go at this point. Nothing's been proven, nothing, I haven't been charged, nothing's gone wrong. So the silence from Marvel could, could be less a case of support, but more a case of biding their time. He was also due to star in another film with Willem Dafoe called uh, The Man the Man in My Basement, I believe. Uh, he, he's been dropped from that. He was doing some sort of uh, commercial work for the US Army. Uh, they, they've shot that stuff, but they've dropped the films. They've pulled the films. Uh, he was going to be doing some work for the Texas Rangers. That's been dropped. And he's been advised and, and asked, requested not to attend the Met Gala, which obviously is one of those big sort of high society Hollywood, you know, Kim Kardashian-esque kind of events in, in uh, New York. Now, footage has been shown, apparently, or leaked to the papers. Uh, Jonathan Major's uh, lawyers have leaked this footage, uh, which allegedly shows that his victim, or the woman who's accused him of, of hitting him, hurting him, and then calling this into the police, was then seen out later that night, clubbing in a nightclub and out. Um, I don't necessarily think it stacks up that just because someone is out later in the evening, they haven't been attacked, they haven't been assaulted, and they haven't been distressed by what they've gone through. But you can already see how the publicity machine or the PR machine around Jonathan Major is going to do everything it can to kind of throw question marks over, over so many aspects of this developing story. He's also attached to a Spike Lee project called The Understudy, um, and Spike Lee hasn't let him go yet, but uh, as, as people in the press are saying, you know, this is possibly more, more likely about the fact that Spike Lee is a, is a, is a, is a, is a fighter. You know, you, you, can't, you can't tear anyone from his tight, light grip if he's got hold of talent, and he won't be wanting to lose Jonathan Majors anytime soon. So where this story really has kind of, you know, charged along this week, really, and this is the sort of more chilling and worrying development, I mean, forget the implications for Hollywood, it's the implications for all these women that are coming forward, is the fact that, you know, a number of, at the moment, unidentified women are what they say cooperating with uh, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. So that in and of itself doesn't look good. You know, the optics on that aren't good. And as I say, he's due in court on May the 8th. I mean, this presents all sorts of problems for Hollywood. You know, th this demonstrates once again the dangers of building any kind of movie or any kind of franchise around one actor or, or one piece of talent. As soon as you have something so big and huge and seismic, sort of depending on one cog, or well, that one cog is such an enormous cog in the entire thing, it becomes an incredibly troublesome uh, prospect. I think where it becomes a problem is for those filmmakers, you know, the lower budget filmmakers who made the film like Magazine Dreams, you know, the director and the filmmakers behind that. You know, he was critical to its success. Uh, the film wouldn't have got sort of greenlit or funded or made if they hadn't got someone like Jonathan Majors attached. What happens in these situations is that often these actors, once they know they're absolutely crucial to the project, and in a sense, the project won't exist without them. What happens with a lot of talent, doesn't just happen in cinema, it happens in television. We've had experience of this too, is that the, the talent senses their strength and flexes their muscles. And in that sense, sets up their own sort of, you know, production company or becomes one of the producers, and then ends up being able to have sort of all sorts of decisions on casting, editorial content, how the character's gonna be portrayed and all that kind of stuff. And I've often said it before, you know, as soon as you see that one of the actors is on the producing credits, for me, you're beginning to verge into however that performance is presented in the film. It's a vanity project. I mean, this, this could be one of the fastest ascendancies that kind of terminates in mid-takeoff mid that there's, there's ever been. So that's Jonathan Majors. 
Next up is a story that we've obviously done a lot about, which was the Alec Baldwin story, the tragic story of Alec Baldwin accidentally shooting on the set of a film called Rust, a Western, uh, his cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, uh, and her sadly passing away. And of course, there's been a sort of evolving kind of, you know, highs and lows, slow sort of circuitous move towards some kind of prosecution. There wasn't going to be a prosecution. Who was responsible? Should there have been a loaded gun? Was the armorer responsible? Was, was Alec Baldwin himself culpable in some way, if not intentionally? You know, was there some kind of corporate manslaughter aspect to this? Were they cutting corners on the shoot? Was the film not observing health and safety standards and all that kind of protocol and all that kind of stuff? Well, this week, Alec Baldwin's, the, the uh, Santa Fe District Attorney's case against Alec Baldwin was thrown out. Uh, he's not going to be charged. You know, he, he must be relieved. He must be massively relieved. But his lawyer, the, or the lawyer for the film Rust, came out saying, well, you know, of course, we're going back to film this. And we've talked about this before. They've gone back and started filming the film out of, they're saying, they're all saying, out of respect for Helena Hutchins. She would have liked this. She was committed to her work, her creativity. Now, I find it shocking that they have done this. But hey, maybe this is true. You know, apparently Helena Hutchins' is, husband is involved in it. I think he may have now become a producer on the film. And so in many regards, maybe they, they all do know that despite this being a tragedy, despite there having been <coughs> some desire to pin the blame specifically on someone, because <coughs> someone has died, let's face it, that perhaps also Helena Hutchins' own creative desire would have been for a project like this to be completed. And in a sense, I guess, for some of her work that she'd shot up until her death to actually be used and be seen. So they're in Montana. There, there's some photos going up in a minute. Uh, there's Alec Baldwin. He's on set, standing beside a horse. There's even a shot of him holding a rifle, and the rifle is facing towards him. I'd imagine it must be an incredibly difficult film to keep filming. Not only from, from the perspective of whoever's on camera or whoever the DOP cinematographer is, because you're going to be aware that you're in someone else's shoes, really. Uh, but also whenever they pull a gun out, and it's a Western, so guns are the iconography of Westerns, aren't they? So whenever they pull a gun out, everyone's, if they're not, I'd have thought almost there would be a sort of, tri tri I hate to use the word triggering, a retriggering of trauma um, each time that happened. So, but in another amazing twist, apparently there's a suggestion that the gun that Alec Baldwin used on the Rust set had a modified trigger. And I think the reason this is important is this means that this could make some sense of that very odd moment that we talked about, where he went on a chat show and he said, I didn't pull the trigger. And everyone was like, well, he must be having some kind of an ex, you know, for all the trauma of this, he didn't mean it, it was a terrible accident. Maybe the traumas made him have an existential sort of breakdown because whatever's happened here, someone's pulled the trigger. Ah, but the, you know, this kind of tallies with what he was saying. So he says he didn't, he insisted he never pulled the trigger, but apparently there's the suggestion, uh, according to the LA Times, that the trigger mechanism on the gun that he used had been changed, and in its being changed, this increased the probability of the gun misfiring. Seems odd that this gun had never been looked at or examined, or that this fact hadn't come to light prior to the charges being uh, you know, brought against him by the Santa Fe District Attorney's Office. Without wishing to use a pun, maybe this was the non-smoking gun that was in the wings that actually led to the unfurling, if you like, or the breakdown of the case. Now, this other story is, is in the world of streaming, but it's again, it's an off it's an off screen story. This this is a another controversy or a building controversy pivoting around social media, but also pivoting around one of the most popular shows at the moment on Netflix called Beef. I've just started watching it. I'm going to review it. I'm, I'm going to do a review of the first five episodes. Once I've got to episode five, I'm in episode four at the moment and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's an incredibly refreshingly un Netflixy Netflix series it's produced by A24. Obviously, they made everything everywhere all at once. They make lots of good indie stuff. But it's nice to finally get something on Netflix that feels like it's got an authorial voice that doesn't feel like it's been... Sometimes I, I worry that Netflix content feels like it's been commissioned, decided, and even made sometimes via some kind of AI algorithm. And I'm sure there is an algorithm at work there somewhere. This doesn't feel like it's part of that. This is called Beef. It uh, stars Stephen Yun uh, and Ali Wong, but it also stars David Cho. And this is around a controversy. The controversy with this show is pivoting around David Cho, who plays Stephen Yun's um, sort of cousin in, in the drama. And I haven't seen all of it yet, but it, it's essentially a sort of... Do you remember the Michael Douglas film Falling Down, where you know an ordinary guy kind of loses his shit when he comes up against the everyday obstacles of just trying to live his life and he takes a gun and he, he just loses he goes mad it's sort of like vigilantism but against the world against against his lot against the way of the world well this is like that and what's clever
clever about it so far for me is that you've got one person, Ali Wong, at the, at the very posh end, and then you've got Stephen Young at the very sort of low end, sort of striving, you know, sort of hand to mouth sort of existence. And it's they're, they're, they, they're connected by an intense dissatisfaction with their lot, their lives and everything. And there's road rage and they seek to kind of destroy each other and all that kind of malarkey. Uh, it's great. It's a sort of soup of modern day sort of fury and frustration with the system. Well, David Cho is, at the moment, I feel quite a small character, but he's a sort of subsidiary comic character. Anyway, the controversy around this guy is he used to do uh, a podcast, which I was really quite shocked and horrified by. His podcast is called DVD ASA, uh, which stands for Double Vaginal, Double Anal Sensitive Artist. In and of itself, okay, so clearly he likes to take his comedy right to the edge. Now, the controversy surrounds a historic um, podcast in which he talked about his behaviour around a masseuse uh, when he went for a massage. He talks about what he got up to, what he did, how he conducted himself with this woman, um, and described himself as, in, as indulging in rapey behaviour. Um, I mean, if you go to some of the transcripts of, of what he was saying to his co-host. He says about telling the story about the masseuse, I, I'm getting turned on just telling this story. I take a hand and I just put it on my dick. She just holds it there. Uh, his co-host then said to him, you raped, allegedly. And Cho, the, the actor, David Cho says, I just want to make it clear that I admit that that's rapey behaviour, but I'm not a rapist. He then talked about the thrill of possibly going to jail. And then she said, his co-host said, you're basically telling us that you're a rapist right now and the only way to get your dick hard is through rape. And then Cho says, yeah. Now, He's kind of retrospectively saying this was a fiction, this was me riffing on something, taking things to the very edge. I never thought, you know, I never did this, this isn't what I did, it was a story, that's my art, that's what I partake in. He wrote later, I never thought I'd wake up one late afternoon and hear myself called a rapist. It sucks, especially because I'm not one. I'm not a rapist, I hate rapists, I think rapists should be raped and murdered. I mean, even his sort of description of what should happen to rapists there is in and of itself a bit suspect. His value system, his moral compass seems a little bit all over the place. Um, he did also go on to say that um, he had zero history of sexual uh, assault. He said he's deeply sorry for anyone who's hurt. Uh, and he also revealed that he'd been through three years of recovery, sobriety and rehabilitation. So this is about historic comments or historic storytelling in which it was suggested quite convincingly by him that he was involved in what he calls himself rapey behaviour. Of course, this throws an enormous spanner in the works, doesn't it, for a show that's doing incredibly well, trending well, huge numbers of viewers are enjoying it. Um, he's certainly a sidebar. I mean, apparently he's also an artist, David Cho, and all of the kind of opening kind of title screens and title holds at the beginning of every episode and, in the, and at the ends are done by him. He, he creates the art for those. Uh, Stephen Young, who's also one of the producers on this, they've, a statement's been issued by the cast and the producers of Beef saying this, the story David Cho fabricated nine years ago is undeniably hurtful and extremely disturbing. We don't condone it and we understand why this has been upsetting and triggering. We're aware that David has apologised in the past for making this up and we've seen him put in the work to get the mental health support he needed over the last decade to make himself better and learn from his mistakes what do you think guys is that enough i mean it's not exactly the same but not an entirely dissimilar thing happened around james gunn who's now head of dc films who was fired by disney marvel uh and then came back uh after a huge petition he did he made historic jokes or he he, he posted historic jokes you know, insensitive, inappropriate jokes about paedophilia, I think. I never saw the original posts uh, on Twitter. And those historic posts came to bite him on the arse. This was about himself. So, of course, what this ends up leaving one thinking is, is he just fanning away the idea that actually he did think like this, he did feel like this, and to what extent has he changed, has he moved on? Can you ever escape words like this? Can you ever ever escape opinions like this? Or are these the, are these the opinions that are embedded within someone who has to hide them? How much do we know that he's doesn't believe in this sort of stuff? Doesn't sort of hold this value system? And to what extent, uh, or to what extent is he, you know, just hiding it? How much is he hiding it? And how much does he actually mean it that it, that, that he's sorry? But of course, it's, it's, it's a huge pain in the neck this for the producers because of course they just want to crack on with this being what it is, which is potentially a huge success on Netflix. There could be other series. It's a huge success for the lead actors. You know, they must all be tickety-boo with how it's doing. And then suddenly this sidebar comes in, which clearly they're trying to damage, limitate and manage themselves. But what do you think, guys? Do you think David Cho's apology was sufficient? Do you think he's done his time? Do you think he's shown his regret? Do you think he should be, if you like, sort of 
harpooned by his own uh, social media, uh, so, well, not social media, but his own previously recorded podcast stories. Do you believe him? Do you think that this is his shtick? Is the, I don't know the rest of his kind of comedy or, or his podcasting or, or what his persona is. Is this what he's about? Does he set out to shock? Is he shocking? I mean, in a way, James Gunn is shocking. I mean, you could argue, well, that's what he does. If you look at his films, that's what he does. He breaks rules. Is that the case with this guy? Does he have a, does he have a sort of track record of doing that or not? And what do you make of the apology on his behalf from the producers and cast of Beef? Well-placed? Ill-judged? Should it affect our enjoyment of the show? Thoughts below, please. And so just on to some of the other sort of casting stories and uh, new movie stories and all that kind of stuff. So what have we got here? James McAvoy. Who doesn't like James McAvoy? Well, I like James McAvoy, but I've seen him in recent interviews. I think he seems to have gone a bit Hollywood, Hollywoodified. Chronicles of Narnia and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, he made it his own. He was in Split and Glass, the M. Night Shyamalan, uh, sort of superhero type kind of films. He played a character with multi-personality disorder. I thought he was excellent in Glass. I didn't, I didn't think the film was necessarily too good, but I thought his performance and his ability to channel all those different characters was absolutely sensational. Well, he's teaming up with Bloomhouse, the horror powerhouse production company, uh, studio, um, to make Speak No Evil. And Speak No Evil is gonna be a remake of an original Danish film, which features a Danish family visiting a Dutch family um, uh, on what's supposed to be like a perfect idyllic sort of trip and what have you. But then suddenly an extraordinary amount of unpleasantness sort of uh, erupts. I haven't seen it, but it, just on the description of it, uh, I think I really want to go and see this. So there's an original Dan I think it's Danish or Dutch film, uh, Speak No Evil. This is going to be a remake of that or a, a rewrite of that. He's a cracking actor, he really is. So that's James McAvoy in a new remake of an original European film called Speak No Evil. Talking of James Gunn, just briefly, James Gunn confirmed on his in on his Instagram account this week, on his internet account, on his Instagram account, that he's written the script for Superman Legacy. It's in pre-production. He's got costume designers working like mad on it already. Um, he released the news on the 85th year anniversary of the first issue of Action Comics, which of course is where Superman first arrived. Um, so Superman Legacy, this is coming from James Gunn. What kind of Superman are we going to get? Are we going to get a sort of, I don't know, sort of, humorous, funny, low-key, real-world kind of Superman. My problem with Superman is he's always a bit embarrassing. I always find him a bit cringe. Can't stand his pants. Don't like the way he pulls his chest out. Can't stand the curl. I just find him a bit naff. Don't even like the way he does that when he flies. It looks like he's smelling his armpits whenever he flies. You know, but it'll be interesting to see what James Gunn can do with him. And obviously, this isn't going to star Henry Carville. So he, they're casting. They're casting for a, for a new Superman. Who do you think could be the new Superman? I think it could be, what's the name of that chap? Who, the very good-looking chap from... Um, um, Euphoria, who seems to be everyone, Lordy, someone Lordy, I can't remember his name, he, he looks like he could be the part. Olivia Wilde, uh, she of, don't worry darling, she of being the temporary short-term girlfriend of um, Harry Styles before he dribbled on Chris Pine's lap. We don't know he did. We don't think he did. Anyway, Olivia Wilde obviously pulled into all sorts of controversy around firing, um, oh, what's his name, Shia LaBeouf, uh, falling out with Florence Pugh. Uh, is she going out with snogging or snogging too much on set? Harry Styles. She made Don't Worry Darling, which was, it kind of fell short for me a bit, but it was an incredibly accomplished, fascinating film. I mean, yeah, she's clearly a good filmmaker. She obviously made Book Smart, the kind of that brilliant sort of girls coming of age comedy. Um, and obviously she's also the, the wife of Jason Stakis, who's the star of Ted Lasso, and they've had a much publicised kind of um, divorce kind of spat where kind of papers have been issued while she's been on stage at sort of Comic Con or Cinema Con or whatever uh, in, the, in their custody battle. So, you know, she's been in the headlines a lot for not necessarily all the right reasons. Well, she's just been announced, and this will be a big one for Nanny Dye, uh, she's directing or going to be directing a TV series uh, based on Jennifer Egan's books, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which I've read, and it's fantastic. It's a sort of gonzo kind of crazy multi-perspective portrait of LA and sort of people in the music industry and even in the way it's like it's a book that's written in weird sort of different styles you've even got a PowerPoint presentation at one point it's druggy it's weird it's kind of it feels like something an artifact from the 70s but it's incredibly it's incredibly sort of entertaining and, and page turning uh, and so she's going to be turning that and the sequel to that The Candy House also obviously by um, Jennifer Egan into a series for television this is coming from A24 too it's her first TV project uh, after two you know successful film outings 
I think she'll be looking to kind of get a little bit of distance from her, or the drama around that worry darling for all the wrong reasons in a sense. And in the world of streaming also, uh, you know, last week we talked about Harry Potter, the TV series, lasting, I think I said in the week of Russia's 10 decades, which as someone quite accurately pointed out would mean it would be going for 100 years. Lunacy. What I meant to say was 10 years, obviously. Um, well, Harry Potter isn't the only thing that's being given the TV series treatment. Neither is Lord of the Rings being given the TV series treatment. Now we've got Twilight. And I have to confess, Twilight was never something I particularly got into. This is obviously, uh, this was immortalised in the movie series uh, in which um, Robert Pattinson, now the Batman, and uh, Kristen Stewart, always want to say Kirsten, Kristen Stewart, were both in that as the vampire Edward Cullen and Bella Swan. Romance, 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 soppy, 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 soppy vampires. All I ever remember was just simpering, sort of moody looks, four locks of hair, lots of heavy eyebrows, oh, oh, lots of heavy eyebrows, but also lots of heavy eyeshadow, lots of pouting, lots of looking, lots of kind of peering over balconies, lots of, lots of uh, neck biting and all. Give me Renfield any day. Anyway, they're turning it into a TV series. The Hollywood Reporter has said that Lionsgate, the movie uh, the movie studio, are going to be adapting the, the Stephanie Myers books and, and turning it into series. And Stephanie Meyer, like J.K. Rowling with the Harry Potter TV series, Stephanie Myers is going to be deeply involved with this. Um, fans, mixed response from Twilight fans. Uh, one of them says on Twitter, I love Twilight, but no, we don't want it. A lot of people don't want the original. It's like Star Wars. If you start to make too much of it, it becomes diluted. It loses focus. It's just then it just becomes intellectual property. It's just like it's just like grilling for oil. It, it no longer has a specialness, and sometimes you want to hold on to the specialness of something. Why does everything have to be spun out into other things? I wouldn't mind if they were spun out and they were good. Spun out for the sake of spun out is just annoying. Someone else, however, said Harry Potter TV show in development at Max, Lionsgate developing a Twilight series, new Hunger Games movie this year. It's like we're in 2011 all over again. And how true is that? It's like, you know, nostalgia for the 80s. We haven't even had nostalgia for the 90s. Have we had nostalgia for the noughties? We're already nostalgic about 2011. And that was only 12 years ago. 12 years ago. And so just a quick roundup of films of the week. Probably the most significant film of this week is Evil Dead Rise. We've done a review of it elsewhere on the channel. Go and check it out. It's 1,700 gallons of blood. It's the fifth movie in the Evil Dead franchise Caesar series. You're gonna get what you, you're gonna get what you pay for to go in there. You're gonna get lots of blood, lots of body parts being severed. You're gonna get lots of kind of ghouly stuff. You're gonna get lots of possessions, lots of demonic stuff. There're gonna be innocent kids running around worried about possessed mothers. There's gonna be chainsaws. There's gonna be lifts full of blood. You name it, it's there. If you fancy, if you just fancy being sort of I don't know, made to puke a lot, uh, go and see it. it. You know, go and check out our review to see what we fully thought of it. You know, the Evil Dead is kind of renowned for having sort of having its tongue firmly stuck in its cheek. Uh, and then, in a sense, and then popping out through your cheek as an eyeball rapidly goes in afterwards. So that's the big release of this week. Another movie that's come out this week, that actually the title of it, has, it kind of doesn't draw me in at all. And so I've kind of overlooked it. I saw the trailer land. It didn't even draw me in the, 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 the trailer. But this is a movie called How to Blow Up a Pipeline, uh, which is a sort of, you know, if you think of our sort of energy crisis, if you think of the way in which, you know, every nation around the world, well, Russia is sort of, you know, you know, sailing ships around seas and sort of assessing whether pipes can be blown up and where, where are oil pipes going to. This is called How to Blow a Pipeline, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And so in this eco aware moment, epoch moment that we are in at the moment. Uh, this couldn't come at a better time really. So this is a film about sabotage, it's about the act of protest, it's about the concept of protest. I, I think it's probably going to be a film about the extent to which, how far one should take protest. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about it a lot with Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion. At what point is a, is a really good cause um, pursuable and at what point do you tip over into a criminality that fine you know some of the best sort of protests n are necessarily criminal but at what point does criminality and protest become something that's actually very dangerous and driven almost as by as many egos uh, and uh, for as many of the wrong reasons as the very industry that you're seeking to sabotage, if you're not to miss. So I think this could be an interesting film for now, actually, given the fact it's quite well released, good release time, isn't it? On the on the very weekend of 50,000 protesters hitting London. Um, so this is about the sort of, if you like, the existential nature of protesting uh, and the lengths you should go to, could go to, and the consequences that can sort of come out of going maybe too far in protesting for a really good cause. And there you have this week's Weekly Rushes. You'll rush, rush through all the movie news, streaming news, and as we've discovered this week, some of the more unpalatable news stories of the week. Share your thoughts below on some of the stories, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah.